welcome everyone. We're gonna um, give people a few more minutes to log in. Um, feel free to turn your cameras on, to say hello, um, and to, um, if you feel comfortable adding your pronouns um, into your uh, little name um, so that we can address you appropriately. Looks like we have some people. Um, Dorota or Mai, do you want to get started with the announcements? Dorota, do you want to take the first one? Oh, she may have disappeared. <laughs> Alrighty, well, hi everyone, my name is May. Um, so for announcements for today, for this evening, um, we're actually gonna be doing a raffle this evening at the end of tonight's event. Um, we have two free tickets to the Lander Analytics um, R Conference, um, June 8th through to 10th. Um, we'll sort of like go through um, how that will work towards the end of the event. Um, and then the second one today is a, um, jobs panel and very rightfully want to make an announcement. Um, the company that I work for, New Visions for Public Schools is hiring. We're hiring for a number of, of different roles, uh, data, uh, product engineering across the board. So feel free to ask me directly um, and or you can go to newvisions.org um, and you can look under careers. Um, and then in terms of um, upcoming events in June, we're going to be doing a book club and we're uh, and this month we're reading the book flow the psychology of optimal experience. Um, so um, feel free to hit up the meetup page for more details on that. Um, and we'll also actually because because we have a few minutes. Um, if anyone who is here is hiring as well um, or has job openings, um, feel free to um, dump it in the chat um, so that we uh, know who to go to. And you can also um, put those offers in our Our Ladies New York City Slack channel. Um, and if you need or want an invite to that, um, let um, me, my, or Dorona know, and we'll make sure that you um, get the link uh, for that sign up. Dorota, you disappeared for a minute, but did you have anything to add to our announcements? I did disappear. I apologize. I was getting some of the food. <laughs> Um, no, I don't think I have anything to add. Just, um, yeah, if you, we post other job opportunities throughout uh, in between meetups on our Slack channel. So check that out. Um, and if you don't have access, let us know. Great. Uh, 
All right, I think we can, let me check my announcements list and then we can get started. Oh, very important announcement. Um, so um, Dorota and Mai are both new to the, um, the Our Ladies board. So if you've seen our May announcements, you'll know that we have a bunch of new board members. Um, so let's uh, be kind and, and give them a nice warm welcome for, um, uh, for leading this, uh, this session. Um, so Maya is going to be on Zoom for Joel. So if you have any tech or uh, Zoom related questions, um, let her know. Um, and she and Dorota are also going to be both monitoring, uh, monitoring the chat. So if you have any questions for our panelists as we go, um, they'll be the ones uh, looking out um, for that um, so that I can keep an eye on my uh, prepared list of questions. Um, so we're, we're going to start with some prepared questions um, and then move into any questions that either come up in the discussion or um, that you as uh, our audience have. Great. Um, so let's start by, by having our panelists introduce themselves. Um, Rachel, do you want to go first? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Erin. Uh, so excited to, to be here with you all tonight. Really, really cool to see, to see you guys show up. Uh, my name is Rachel Cohen. I uh, manage a job search program and career coaching team at Bloom Tech, which is an online live coding bootcamp um, that focuses on data science and full stack web development. Um, previously, I worked at the Data Science Institute at Columbia, running their career development program. Um, and before that, I was in technical recruiting. So I've worked with at this point, uh, over a thousand job searchers in the data and analytics space. Um, and so I'm really excited to be able to join you guys tonight and talk a little bit about it. I guess I'll go next. Hi, everyone. My name is Shivani. Uh, really excited to be here, excited to see all of these faces. Um, I have been in recruitment for around six years now. I worked on roles across product, design, engineering, data analytics, architecture, and then other corporate functions like finance, HR, the whole gamut. Um, before be, uh, becoming a recruiter, I was an SQL developer. So I know a little bit about your world, although I did for a very little time. Um, and right now I work as a senior recruiter at Leica. Leica is a SaaS company, small startup that has this product that helps companies with compliance and quick shameless plug, we're also hiring for roles on our product design and engineering. Awesome, thank you both so much. Um, all right, we will start uh, with um, if there is one general or specific uh, piece of advice you would give to new job seekers what would it be? I picked on Rachel first last time, so. <laughs> Bonnie, you're up. Yep. Um, first of all, one was hard, but one thing I always say is make sure you present the value you bring to the table accurately and confidently. And that should, everything you can do, everything you've learned so far should reflect in your resume and all of your interviews. And specifically when it comes to this world of data analytics, I think if I understand it correctly to an extent, uh, telling the story that data tells. So personally, or for me, I would say that that's what your resume should do. That's what your interviews should, should do as well. You should always be looking to tell a story through numbers, through KPIs, through achievements that can be measured, that are uh, that can be demonstrated to say, here are my skills, and here is how I have contributed to an organization or a team's success so far. And there's a value I intend to add to your organization. Yeah, oh, I love that. Um, the one thing I was going to throw out there was, was honestly something you're all already doing by being here tonight, which is just connecting with other professionals and, and networking. Um, and I remember right when right when the pandemic started, if we can remember way back then, um, like the whole idea of virtual networking was so uh, scary and different. And, and how are we gonna network if we can't like go physically in person? Like I remember hosting Our Ladies events at Columbia and they were so great because we could all meet in person. Um, and 
I think actually networking remotely gives you a huge edge um, in terms of networking, right? Because you should all be listening, listening to us because we have things to say, but you can also be looking each other up on LinkedIn, right? Where do you all work? Who might you follow up with after this event? Now you have the shared virtual experience and you can connect about that here and then also afterwards. Um, you have people's full names without having to awkwardly ask them. There's actually lots of really nice benefits about networking on Zoom. And so just by being here, you're already taking advantage of that. Um, and so that's a great first step. And then the other thing that I'll throw out there is that networking should happen not just when you're active in a job search, right? It's like a career long pursuit. And like Our Ladies is such a wonderful community. So finding communities like that, where you can continue to engage, um, you won't ever really have to job search again, right? Because you'll come to events like this, hear about open roles, talk to people. And so it'll just make your lives so, so much easier. So the importance of networking when you're active in a job search, but then really just throughout your career as well. Great, thank you. And um, for anyone who wants to chat with this group uh, of wonderful Our Ladies, again, sign up for our Slack, it's great. And then you can network us with us whenever you want, uh, or just ask uh, our related questions. Someone will answer, uh, though maybe Stack Overflow will be faster. Um, all right, so I'm going to kind of switch off between questions aimed at um, more intro job seekers and questions aimed at more um, experienced job seekers just because I um, don't know uh, exactly where our audience is, um, but this is where um, if you uh, in the audience have a question, again, put it in the chat um, so that we can make sure that your questions get answered. Um, all right, so for um, maybe a more experienced um, job seeker, um, is it better to move between companies successively, like maybe say one to two years um, in order to advance or stick with sort of one company that you can see a path that um, and work your way up? Oh, I love that question. Um, I think that it, oh, okay, so obviously it depends. So it totally depends. Um, the most important thing is that you're just having really honest conversations with your with your manager, right? So if you're at a company and you can see that career path and you have support for taking on additional responsibilities, whether you want that to be, you know, more in like a senior technical role or like a management position, you should understand how you would move sort of in that direction and have the support of your leadership. Um, and if you have that, there's no reason to jump between companies per se. A lot of times when you're in your first or second role, you can sometimes get stuck in an individual contributor role. If, and if you don't want that to be the case, then moving companies might allow you to, to grow in a way if you're, if you're not seeing that support at your current role. So just having those conversations. I mean, if you've never tried to have those conversations, first of all, role play it with a buddy, like find someone here you can practice it with. Um, but just like Shivani said, go in, go in confident to those conversations and why you're looking to grow. It will be so clear from the response of your leadership, whether they'll, they're willing to work with you or not. And if you can grow at your current company and then a few years later move laterally or into an even more senior role, there can be a lot of like benefits there in terms of compensation. So that's another thing to, to keep in mind. I 100% agree with Rachel here. Um, and I know this sounds like something you hear a lot, but it does depend on um, moving between companies or staying in your in your current company. There is no one answer to this question. There's no one pill solves all problems. The main part here being advancement, professional development. As long as that's happening, it doesn't matter which path you take. One thing that I'd add there is know what you want. Create your own career path, create your own vision board, and then see what aligns with it. Is it the career path you see at your current organization? Do they have opportunities for you to work on new projects? Do they have opportunities for you to work with a new business unit, another team? Does that be the that you need? Or in your role, is it in that exposure that you need? Because if that's the case, you might have to switch. There are big organizations where you can get to work with clients from different industries. So really knowing what you want and then looking at what your organization can and can't offer. And of course, having those conversations with your leadership, making sure there's 
transparency and they also know what it is that you're looking for for your next steps because it should come as a surprise. If you think that you'll go up to your manager today and ask for an opportunity for tomorrow or next month, it's not going to happen. So have those conversations on a continuous basis so that they also know to develop you to do those opportunities in the direction that suits you. Those are both great answers. Um, I'll just add from my own experience that if the path that you want doesn't exist, then that that element of communication is super important to figure out if there is a way to, to get at it. Um, so for me personally, I have zero interest in managing people. Um, and that is the only way to be promoted or was the only way to be promoted in my company. And I had those communications of like, look, I just want to be promoted on a technical side of things. And so I shoved that ability into existence just by having those uh, uh, conversations. Totally. I love that. And also the one thing, other thing I'll add is like, I think especially in this job market and with inflation, um, you know, I've been having conversations with a lot of people around, like, I know my peers who were like hired more recently are making more money or in the same position. So I know that's sometimes salary is tied to being promoted and sometimes it's not, but if you're in a role for a year or two and people are being hired more recently at the same or more salary, you don't need to be promoted to ask for a raise. Um, so absolutely feel confident in asking for that. I promise you, your peers are asking for it if you're not. Super helpful. Um, all right, now a, a personal struggle for me question, um, which, and since you are, are both vaguely familiar with uh, helping people with data jobs, um, I'm, I'm hoping that you can provide some insight, uh, which is that data science, data analytics, data product, job descriptions uh, are super hard to read and titles are meaningless. Um, so how can we as job seekers understand what the, the job actually entails uh, from a poorly written job description? Oh, I love this question. Do you mind if I jump in? Yeah, yes. go ahead. Okay. So you will never really know just from a job description. I'm sorry, Erin. I wanted to give you like a secret formula, but it's very hard to actually know. But I think what a lot of people do is look at a job description see that you meet whatever percentage of it, um, and then either apply or discount yourself for the role like based on that. Um, especially, so there's two things you wanna focus on. What percentage of the, job, of the job description do you meet? If you meet half, you apply. Um, if some of the, the uh, if some like the bullet points that you meet are higher up on the list and like even better, but honestly, even if you meet the bottom half, that's like the, literally in the writing, um, go ahead and apply to it. And then when you like with every job description, with every job application, excuse me, you should be emailing someone at the company, right? So if you're emailing someone or networking with someone to learn more about it, you want to ask those specific questions that you can't parse out from the job description. But like Aaron, to your point, it does like for data science roles or analytics roles, there's so many, there's so many titles that you should be like keyword searching based on technical skills and then looking to meet half of the half of the descriptions and then reach out to someone because it's hard to tell. Now, when you see a good job description, it's like a work of art. It's like, I can actually picture what you're doing or if it even lists who it's reporting to. Sometimes knowing if you're like reporting into the engineering org or reporting into like a product or marketing or HR org is usually insightful right? because if you're reporting into someone technical, likely your day-to-day -day would be very different than if you're like the only data person on a functional team or something like that. So those are kind of hints that you can look at who you're reporting into, what problems you might be looking to solve, but sometimes it's just very vague. And so you'll just want to reach out to someone. All really, really good points. Um, I'll let you in on a little recruiter secret, not just data science or data analytics, almost all JDs are badly written. We struggle with this on a day-to-day -day basis because a lot of these JDs are coming from hiring managers who want to put into the JD everything that they hope the person can do. And personally, for, for me, what I do is use this little um, age-old uh, method of command F or control F to find keywords. Not the best thing, but to parse a JD. Think about human nature, right? 
when you start listing requirements, the ones that come to mind first are the ones you are that are mostly must-haves. When you're putting requirements of, on the JD, most likely, most often than not, they'll be listed in, in an order of most needed, good if someone can do this job. So look for what you want to do. I keep going back to that, but know what you want to do. And that's not just in terms of a title, but the type of work you want to do. Know what you want to do. Do your search on the JD, even, even if it's a keyword-based search. Look for those keywords and see how much you have to scroll to reach that point. If it was at the bottom of the requirements, it's possibly a part of the job, not necessarily a main uh, responsibility or, um, or something that your performance will be uh, judged on or measured on. So look for those things. See how many times uh, a keyword a responsibility appeared on a job description, uh, how much you have to scroll to find it, and think of what is more important to you. And then definitely, I want to reiterate what Rachel said. Never try to fulfill all the requirements on a JD. If you meet 50% of the requirements, go ahead and apply. A lot of these job descriptions are actually wish lists. <laughs> Nobody's expecting you to know how to do everything that's listed on that long, long job description. That's super helpful, though not the nice magic bullet that I constantly hope for for understanding job descriptions. <laughs> Um, and I will reiterate just for, for this crowd that especially in data, titles are meaningless. I have never found a like the title of a job description to be representative of the the like seniority rank or the um like what's covered in the, the job description under details. So if you are like um like super into being a data scientist and don't want to look at any data analyst roles because of the weird stigma difference between them. Um, the industry doesn't know about the weird stigma difference between them. Um, so I, I just, yeah, they could be exactly the same. Role. Yeah, no, job titles definitely vary a lot depending on the organization, whether it's a small startup, whether it's a big organization, is the hierarchy flat? Is it a, the, the structure more complicated? Job titles can be so misleading. I would definitely echo again, Rachel, your thoughts. Reach out to someone, learn more. You can never know exactly what you're getting into just from a job description. Yeah, and I get the question pretty often of like, but if I go into a data analyst position first, will I be pigeonholed if I ever want to go into data scientist role? I'm like, absolutely not, because mm -hmm. you just put both titles on your resume. You put the company name and then you put data scientist slash data analyst and that's totally kosher. You're fine. Absolutely. Ooh, um, we have an excellent question from Tiffany, which is what is the difference between a data analyst and a data scientist? Um, I am happy to take that if Rachel and Ronnie don't uh, feel as comfortable answering it. Um, okay. Go ahead. I'm sure you have the best answer. <laughs> uh, all right. So, so my personal, okay. So I will start by saying there is no difference um, uh, because uh, labels are meaningless. Um, but there, there, as I was saying, there is this weird stigma attached to data um, analysts where it's the like lower paying lower rate job. And so people want to be in the, the data scientist side. So there, the, some people sort of divide that um, idea. Uh, I like thinking of it as uh, front of house versus back of house. Um, so a data analyst might be more likely to do um, uh, analysis projects and data cleaning and um, dashboards and visualizations and reports for stakeholders and and really doing the, the storytelling with data and the visualization side of things. Whereas a data scientist might be doing a little bit more engineering work, certainly a lot more statistics um, and um, uh, really like running those models on the, like the back end of uh, development. That said, um, plenty of statistics and model building happens in analysis that a data analyst does and plenty of data science only do data visualization and data cleaning. So like, yeah, labels are meaningless. Um, do either of you have anything you want to add to my definition or do um, 
Maya Dorota wanna? No, I think that was I think that was spot on. The the only thing I'll add is that just given knowing like the technical skill level of, of folks that are probably here, um, you just want to make sure when you're looking at like data analyst role that you're really looking at the tech stack, right? Because if it is more just like an, a purely Excel based position, those are great roles, but might not be at the technical level that folks here are targeting. So really, just like again, those keyword searches end up being so important um, to make sure it's the right fit. Absolutely. Um, we also have a, a question from the chat. Um, um, do you have any suggestion for new grads when looking for a job? So what, oh, so um, I, I don't know if this is new grads out of a master's or new grads out of a bachelor's, um, but either way, suggestions for early job seekers. I'll start this one. Yeah. yeah, so I'm thinking about this question and then I'm trying to like condense it because there's so much, but um, you already mentioned networking, start it early, start it while you're still a student, be it professors, be it with other professionals. One thing that I recommend highly is keeping your eyes and ears open, open. There are so many events, so many conferences happening on a daily basis and you don't have to attend each one of those. Even if, if you just look at these websites that they create for these events, look at the speakers, look at how many of those speakers had a career path similar to yours or a career path that you would like to have, reach out to them, connect with them. If nothing else, you'll be connected to them on LinkedIn and you'll see updates, you'll see important information about other events happening, about a new technology, about a new problem that's been solved. There is so much that happens just by following people. Social media, I know it has pros and cons, like exactly Facebook, but use it for your own good. There is so much information out there. Just keeping a tab on, just scrolling through your news feed can give you so much insight into what's going on. and what's relevant to your industry right now. So that's one thing I recommend. The second thing I would say is going back to knowing what it is where you want to start. And you might not know to begin with. I didn't know what I wanted to do, of course. I was an SQL developer turned recruiter. But know where you want to start or start somewhere. Talk to people. Look at all the options you have. And then create a path for yourself thinking of where you want to be. With that, start thinking what else you can add to your skill set because you have to continuously learn on a daily, monthly, weekly basis, whatever, whatever, especially when you work in the world of technology where every second day there's a new tool coming up, there are technologies that are became, becoming outdated. You have to keep your, uh, your skills or your knowledge base up to date, keep learning and then keep looking at opportunities that new learnings can create for you and then go from there apply to that job talk to that person who posted that job see where you can go and then ultimately resume I think resume this is a very basic thing but look at your resume make sure it's clean understandable it's highlighting things that you excel at that you want to do but that's just getting you an entry into the door once you're in there talk to people and know that when you're interviewing, it's a two-way street. You're assessing the opportunity as much as you're you being assessed. So go in there, prepare to answer questions, but also ask questions so that you know um, what you're getting into. Yeah, I'm glad this is recorded because everyone should write all those down. That was, that was <laughs> amazing. Um, the, really, the only thing I'm gonna add, like sort of more on the motivation front, is your first job search in the space will by far be your hardest. It'll be harder than any subsequent job search in the data space because um, you just need to get those first few years of experience and then it becomes, I see Aaron nodding, I'm sure. Are there other like second or third job searchers? Feel free to like thumbs up. I'm curious if we have other folks who've been through like a second or third job search in the space. There we go. Okay. I see Rachel, Dorota. Awesome. Yeah. It's just going to by far be your hardest. Um, oh, awesome. I see Millie also. Um, do whatever you need to do to stay motivated. So like what we talk about at Bloom Tech is we do like uh, 10 applications, 10 outreaches a week philosophy. So you should not be spamming uh, your resume everywhere and you should not be messaging a thousand people. If you're sending in 10 applications based on like jobs that you meet 50% of the requirements of and reaching out to someone at those opportunities, 
you'll start getting interviews. Um, but it's really about maintaining that consistency and doing the outreach. Find yourself a buddy. Like if you have, if I don't know if you just finished school or if you're just transitioning into this field, find someone else who's job searching as like an accountability buddy. Go to a coffee shop together or if you're remote, sit on Zoom and apply to jobs. It is way more fun. And honestly, you can laugh at some of like the ridiculous stuff that you find out there also. Um, hit those goals, do something to celebrate. And sometimes you'll be able to hit like 10 applications and 10 outreach. Sometimes on like a Monday, right? Like if your job's working full-time, work on a project, go to an event like this um, and then start again the next week. I promise you, you do not need to apply to a hundred jobs a week. If you're finding the right places and reaching out to, to people that you know are, are on the hiring team, then you'll make progress and just stay motivated. It gets better, I promise. Great. Um, we have three people who sort of asked the same question. So Millie, Jesse, and um, uh, Samisa, Samisa, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Um, and also Tal or Ty, uh, again, sorry for mispronouncing your name. Um, but all of their questions are around the idea of um, what should go on a resume when you are switching um, industries or careers? So for people that are um, that have professional certificates, should they list them? For people that have coursework, how much detail do you get into that when you don't have the professional experience background, um, but you're not necessarily a, a totally new um, uh, job seeker? Yeah, I'll defer to the recruiter on this one. Um, that's a really good question. And here's what I say. When someone tells me they have no experience, I say that's not possible. You have definitely worked on something. You, there has to have been some project you worked on, even if it didn't have the title that you are applying for. So first, think of things you've done. And then when you're putting them on your resume, make sure you're highlighting things that relate to the job that you're applying for. And it's easier when you start, right? Um, it's easier to have a resume template that you can customize quickly depending on the job that you're applying to. You wanna make sure you're highlighting the things that add value to the job that you wanna get. Everything that you've done that relates closely to it should be highlighted. And a lot, a lot of recruiters get bad rep for not looking at resumes. I look at resumes, of course, but the difference between a good resume and one that I love to come back to after I've looked at the others I have is just a clean resume. Being able to see in that first look, can I spot the keywords that I am, I'm looking for? And when I say I, I mean anyone who's looking at your resume where it's, it's like the first step of screening. So just like I recommend you search for keywords on a job description, the similar thing's gonna happen when you submit your resume. So it's really important that you hit the keywords there depending on the job that you're looking for. It's clean, it's readable, and going back to if you're applying for a job in data, make sure there's some data on your resume. There's something that says, I reduced the query time for 10, from 10 minutes to two minutes or whatever it might be. Put that on your resume, bold it, highlight it, so that that's the first thing that catches the eye of the person who's reading your resume. And then um, another thing I like to quickly add here is cover letters highly debated topic. A lot of people love them, a lot of people hate them, but what I say is it can never hurt you. Keep it short, keep it to the point of saying, here are my skills, here is how they align with what you're looking for. I think I can add value, this is why. As long as it's short, it's not gonna hurt your application if, if it doesn't add value. Yeah, the only thing I'll add is if you do have like um, extensive previous experience, and by extensive, I mean like some doesn't have to be like decades. If you have some previous experience, absolutely include that on your resume, right? I always say like if companies are, if companies are looking to hire someone who's like, I don't know, went through undergrad, got some like analytics or CS degree, and then is applying to their first job, they'll find that person. But if they're looking for someone who has previous, you know, maybe customer facing, maybe communicate like communications heavy, um, any other previous experience that will be valuable in the data space, which is a ton of different experience, then they'll want to hire you. So put it on your resume, try to think about, look at what soft skills are listed on the job descriptions, which are usually a lot and kind of like the basic ones. So you can kind of use those to just tailor one version um, and definitely include that previous experience on there. I'll also throw out there that if you're 
doing the outreach with your job applications, like anytime you can just connect with someone, your resume just starts to matter so much less. So definitely you need to have a clean resume. You need to like do everything that Shivani just said. But if you're just talking to someone, anytime you just get past the resume hurdle, so that could be a networking conversation or whatever, your resume doesn't matter anymore because you clearly have enough. That's why you're even reaching out. And then it's just get making that final connection. So spend time on your resume, but don't, I've worked with so many people who like literally delay their job search by months because the resume is so daunting to them. Get it done, have some few people look at it and just start reaching out to people. You'll be fine. That's a good point. And that reminds me, Google has a lot of resume templates. All of them are good. Pick one and put your stuff on it. Um, and good point there, if you have a lot of experience, it's also important to make your resume short to highlight things that are relevant to the job again. For example, for me, when I started applying to recruiter jobs, my SQL developer section kept getting smaller because nobody cared about that when I was uh, applying for a recruiter job. So think about that and then I'll customize your resume for sure. Yeah, and I'll just, just add that if you're um, jumping into data from a, a completely different industry, a great way to show that you have coding skills is to have a, a blog or at least um, an example of a project on your um, your GitHub or your GitLab and then to um, link that on your resume so that, that people can see um, or talk about that in your cover letter so that um, people can, can see that you do have um, the skills, even if they're not um, listed under classes or, or uh, previous job experience specifically. Um, all right. Um, I, so I had uh, rounded up like three or four questions for that one. So if I didn't answer your specific question, feel free to shove it back in the chat so that, that um, we can make sure we get to it. Um, but again, uh, summing up a couple of questions, um, we have um, uh, what is a, like a normal tech or database interview process? Um, who should you be talking with? How do you know who you should be talking with? And what kind of technical questions should you prepare for? Awesome, love that question. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about what a typical process is and then I'm gonna like totally trash everything that I say. So like a normal process that you'll see, and I'm sure folks on here can attest to it, is some sort of recruiter screen, some sort of either at this point, like a technical challenge, a technical take home um, or a hiring manager screen. Sometimes those orders switch and then some sort of like on site or panel if it's remote. So you're talking to multiple people on the team, maybe stakeholders who you'll be working with or maybe just other uh, data professionals on your team. That's like the usual kind of like what you'll see, what the technical interview is or what the technical challenge is. And like I see some folks smiling while the video off, it totally varies by company and role. So my advice is always just don't prepare in advance. That doesn't mean don't keep your technical skills sharp. Um, and if you're applying for like very software heavy roles, you should be doing lead code challenges and keeping that, those skills sharp. But do not, again, over rotate to, I need to be able to solve every technical interview uh, before I go in because you literally won't be able to. That said, you should absolutely always know three things before you go into any interview for a data role, which is one, who are you meeting with? It sounds obvious, but sometimes they don't send you the name. So who you're meeting with, if there'll be a technical component to the conversation and what that technical component, like what the format or content might be. Um, they don't always send that information, but you can always ask. You can always ask, will, this, will there be a technical component to this conversation? And if so, what is the format and content? It shows that you wanna be prepared. A good, like the vast majority of places don't wanna trick you. They might say like, oh, we're gonna be, going through some like basic SQL queries. Great, so you'll brush up on that, right? You might not want you to have something over that you're searching for it, like a, a tab open and searching during the interview, that wouldn't be great, but you can absolutely brush up in advance just like you would for a job. So you should know who you're meeting with, if it'll be technical and what it covers, and then you'll be set for kind of any interview and know how to prepare for it. Definitely, um, cannot stress that enough feel free to ask at the very first round what the rest of the interview process is going to look like. Recruiters should tell you, but if they forget, ask them. They should be happy to tell you because trust me, we're trying to fill that job as much as you're trying to get that job. So most people want to set you up for success. Take that initiative, ask all the questions, and yes, look up the person you're going to meet with. Once you know who you're meeting with, be prepared to speak their language. If it's a business stakeholder, your answer should be tailored to business outcomes, bottom line, um, high level goals. 
if it's a technical person, your language should be technical. It should be our R, Python, SQL, whatever it is that you're looking for. I cannot emphasize this enough because there have been so many times when people forget. Since you work in a world where you're so technical, sometimes you forget that the person you're talking to might not be able to understand and absorb all the information you're giving them. So remember to differentiate your communication that way. Um, in terms of an interview process, yes, it's going to be different for every company, every position, also depending on whether it's an entry level role, mid senior, senior level, there are going to be different types of rounds. But one thing I will say is that gives you a good sense of who you're going to be working with as well. If a role is truly cross functional, you will meet with people from different functions across the organization. If a role is more internal, you will meet with people internally from the team. So you can also make a good assessment from there as to where this role might branch out and how many other teams you might get to work with. I think that's um, a great segue into um, my next question, which is, um, as you're interviewing, um, what are some red flags um, to look for um, that either the, the company or the manager or the job is not going to be a good fit? Red flags. Um, happy to get, get you started there. Um, I think the first one is lack of transparency or vague answers when it's to questions relate, related to career passing opportunities. When you ask those questions, you will expect answers. And don't get me wrong, there are times when there really is, there really could be potentially three different paths that you can take up after your after the show, or there might be three different kind of opportunities, which is for a software engineer, for example, you could become an engineering manager, you could become a software architect. So there could be possibilities. There does not have to be a path set in snow, stone, but they should be able to tell you that. If you hear an answer that's completely vague, that leads to you thinking, I don't know what I just heard. I have no clue where I'm going from here. That's one red flag. The other one that I always mention is an interview should never feel like it was a one-sided conversation. I can't emphasize this enough. It's a two-way assessment. As much as they're asking you questions, they should be willing to answer your questions, give you the information that you need to be able to make an informed decision. Um, and the last thing, and this I'm kind of, I might sound like a broken record here, but um, like I said, when you're in an industry that's all about data telling stories from that data, being able to um, use that data for other things, your resume, your interview answers should reflect the same. On the flip side or on the other side of the table, your interviewers or your manager's approach to the conversation should reflect the values of the organization, the culture of the organization. So you can assess a lot from there. If they say that we encourage open communication, they will encourage your questions as well. That's just one example. Yeah, absolutely. Um, also do, you know, do research in advance, right? When you prepare those questions that you wanna ask at the end of the interview. And so like on top of looking up the person that you're meeting with and looking up the company and the role, look at their careers page. Mm -hmm. Who are they promoting, right? Are there people there who look like you, who have backgrounds like you? And if not, ask why and ask what they're doing um, to increase diversity at their companies. Um, I think people get nervous to ask that question in an interview because it's going to seem like maybe combative or some way. So you don't want to ask the question like, why don't you have more women who work in your engineering org or something straight up? But you can say, what are you doing to increase diversity of your engineering org? I want to make sure I'm working for a company that values that. Their answer will be so telling. <laughs> it's very... And I've been in these conversations and I've been in these conversations from like thinking about, you know, companies that we partner with, um, just like saying, oh, we're interviewing women is, is not a sufficient answer. Right. But really understanding like systemically, do they have employee resource groups? Are they promoting from within? Are they, you know, are they putting women in positions of leadership is, is really telling every answer is going to be different, but you'll be able to tell they should be prepared to answer that question. And you should be confident asking something like that. If you notice that, like, it's an engineering org where there, it just maybe lacks the diversity that you're hoping for. Great. Helpful. Um, I'll add that it's also helpful, uh, again, to know what you want. And if someone actively says something against that, um, so if you're like super gung ho about the remote working from home environment and applied to a, a hybrid or remote job, and then they, 
they turn around and like, we're going to expect you in the office four days a week, then maybe that's um, a giant red flag for you. Um, that kind of thing as well. Um, all right, those are the end of my prepared questions. Um, so again, if you have um, other questions, please put them in the chat to either everyone or Dorota or me um, or my, and we will ask them. Um, so we have one that is, um, how can someone from another country try and get a job in this country? What are some things to consider? Um, so specifically around um, recruiting and hiring people from uh, out of country. Is this question about like, re do you want to relocate or just like work for a US company from abroad? The latter, um, but if you ask that question, feel free to elaborate in the chat. Relocation. Cool. Um, I have some thoughts, Shimon, do you want to start with that one? Or should I jump in? Uh, yeah, there uh, are this one. So if you're looking to relocate, there could still be things beyond just location, right? Work authorization, visa sponsor sponsorship, that varies from an organization to another, from one role to another, because it comes with a fee, it comes with a process. Now, not every department would or wouldn't have a budget for sponsorship. So those are important things to know. What I would say is, that shouldn't stop you from applying. Apply, most application forms have a very direct question where they ask you whether or not you need sponsorship. Be transparent if you need it, say yes. If you, if you don't, say no. Um, if the organization has the budget and they have the, the resources to give you work authorization and that sponsorship, they'll talk to you. They'll talk to you further about what that process would look like. If not, they won't. And that's fine. What's the worst part? that'll happen? Your application will be closed. The other thing that I'll say is important is do some research online because there are a million types of work visas out there. Um, as a recruiter, I still see new ones every day that I don't know about. So do your research as well, because when you get that call with, with a company that is exploring all of these options, you will be able to inform them sometimes about what other options are available. Now, especially when there are so many, so much remote work, um, so many remote work opportunities out there, there are options like being a contractor instead of a full-time employee. There are so many of those arrangements that could potentially work out. So do the research, um, look at the organization, usually the scale of the organization also, um, sometimes it will tell you whether or not they might have the budget to do something like that at this time. A lot of small organizations are not able to do that. Again, don't, you can be sure about that, so definitely apply, and when you hear back, discuss it further. But one thing that's helpful is if you're looking to relocate, start doing this early on. Before you move, start looking for jobs. And I can say this from personal experience because I moved to the States from India about six years back. Before I moved here, I was looking at what types of work opportunities were available in the area that I was moved to. Was it heavy in one industry versus another? Are there finance jobs? Are there tech jobs? So do that research, start applying, start reaching out to people. Networking will come in handy again. Uh, connect with people in your industry, connect with people in the HR industry that might be able to give you pointers about jobs uh, in that location. Totally. The majority of my experience is with folks who are like international talent who studied in the US and then was looking for employment. So that's like only just one very specific path. Um, but my general advice is always like, look for large multinational organizations where there might be multiple locations that could hire you. They might be set up, might have more like financial um, just like backing. There are also websites where you can see which companies have sponsored different types of visas. I'm not even going to pretend to have those links handy like I used to, but there's like some good databases out there that you can search and see what companies might be a bit more fruitful to go after. So, so do some digging around there. Yeah. And I think there are some programs too. I can't for my life. I think there was a program called nomad something but that was specific to teachers so this was for teachers who were looking to relocate to the u.s and they wanted assistance with visa programs and sponsorship so there are programs like that to google it you'll find you'll find options great 
super helpful. Um, Teaching nomads, I'm sorry. <laughs> Just came back to me. Uh, do we have a last, uh, last call for questions? Um, and then we can um, move along to our, our wrap up. Uh, Maya Dorota, are you seeing any questions coming in? Nope. All right. Um, Rachel Shivani, do you have any other uh, hot tidbits that we didn't ask you about? I don't think so, but this was a blast. And please feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn if I can provide any networking support or anything. I'm happy to. It's really fun to be here with you guys. Absolutely. Same. Um, please feel free to connect with me. I'm always happy to make new connections and chat if you want. I think we did a lot of knowledge sharing here, spewing out knowledge. I hope that was a little helpful. Happy to answer more questions as many you think of them. Great, thank you both so much. We really appreciate um, having you to, to answer all of my and also everybody else's uh, questions. Um, and uh, for those of you that are here or for those of you uh, who want to review all the questions and answers afterwards, this is being recorded um, and will be posted on our um, our ladies YouTube channel situation. Um, there is a, a significant time lag between us uh, actually having the recording and it getting on YouTube, um, but we'll put it in Slack and probably on our Twitter account um, when that is ready. Uh, and we have